Hello. And thank you for joining the latest Boutique Hotel News webinar. And today we're hosting this webinar in partnership with Agilisys. And we are going to be talking about optimizing operations with a modern point of sale. My name's Eloise Hansen. I'm your host for today's webinar. Um, and when I'm not hosting webinars, I'm the editor of Boutique Hotel News, and we are an online trade publication covering the global boutique, lifestyle and luxury hotel industry. As I mentioned, uh, today's webinar is in partnership with Agilisys, um, a hospitality software company. Uh, which helps customers to achieve high return hospitality. Uh, we do have Matthew Prosser on our webinar today. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand over to Matthew to introduce himself as well as the company Agilisys. So Matthew, welcome and over to you. Well, thank you very much, Eloise. It's uh, a pleasure once again to be participating in, a, in a, one of your wonderful webinars and uh, Thank you. Uh, I guess a bit of background on myself. I've I've had 30 years in this industry, love this industry, never going to leave this industry. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an ex-operator and spent 25 plus years now in the supply chain being a bit of a technology geek. And I hope we can have some really good, meaningful conversation today on the on the wonderful world of point of sale. Uh, so far as Agilisys is concerned, uh, well, its roots are firmly implanted in the US. Uh, dates back to the 60s, but we're a truly global company now. Uh, we design, create and develop products that deliver what you've termed as high return hospitality. And perhaps as we talk, we'll find out a little bit more about what that means. Uh, we do that by developing interactions that, that essentially digitizes and tailors guest personalization. And it results in the ability to monetize, which is really important, mm -hmm. and generate higher profitability. Uh, all verticals of hospitality are served by ourselves. And we provide a complete ecosystem of modernized, intuitive, current and feature rich products. And once again, really looking forward to some meaningful conversation today. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and further details about Agilisys and also uh, Matthew's contact details have been popped into the chat there if you'd like to learn more. Uh, so let's meet our other speakers today. And for ease, I'm going to go from left to right as per the PowerPoint slide. Uh, so, Andrew, let's move to yourself first and welcome. Cheers. Thanks, Eloise. I've just realised I've got the same jacket and shirt on as the photo. Um, <laughs> um, so, Andrew Kendrick, uh, Managing Director of Hotels for Splendid Hospitality Group. Um, I've been with Splendid now for eight and a half years. Uh, prior prior to that, um, I used to work for some of the management companies um, throughout the UK. Uh, and prior to that, um, my parents had had a couple of hotels growing up. So when when I say I was born in the industry, I was I was literally born in the industry. Um, Going back to Splendid, we, we operate 24 hotels across the UK, everything from uh, as north as Glenrothes, which is north of Edinburgh, mm -hmm. all the way down to uh, Gatwick in London, um, and everything from east to west, from you know York to Bristol. We operate um, across nine brands now. Um, some of the big ones, Hilton, IHG, Accor, Marriott, etc., um, and everything from one end of the spectrum to the other. So, you know, today I'm, I'm sat in the Grand Hotel in York, which is York's only five-star hotel, a, a proper five-star resort hotel with cookery school, um, fingers crossed, hopefully a Michelin-star restaurant in the coming coming months, um, all the way to large M&E houses like Hilton London Bankside, which cater for a 1,000 people. Um, mm -hmm. And everything to the select service, you know, unbranded properties to um, easy hotels, select service brands, etc. Um, and everything from 350 bedrooms per property down to 22 bed boutique hotel in Oxford. So, um, so we uh, we're, we're a broad church, if I put it that way, in Splendid, and we operate uh, a number of different type of properties. Super, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Christian, over to yourself. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Um, I'm Christian Dykstra from Sion Capital. Um, we're a owner, well, co-investor and manager of hotels throughout the UK. Currently, the portfolio exists of seven properties, uh, split four in London and, and three uh, throughout provincial UK, um, operated uh, either by with a brand or without. Super. Thank you, Christian. And last, but by no means least, Declan, welcome. 
Thank you very much. Um, hi, Declan Mungan. I am a IT manager working with Hilton Worldwide. Um, I look after a selection of hotels from support uh, perspective on a day-to-day -day basis and also have the role of being a technical advisor for Europe, Middle East and Africa for FMB uh, systems. I have been around uh, quite a while in the business, um, nearly 30 years with Hilton. And formerly, I've worked with um, other brands in the Republic of Ireland, and I've also uh, worked in Switzerland uh, as well. So uh, quite interested in F&B systems. Uh, not much you can confuse me with. I'm fluent in German and Italian and uh, Swiss. So, uh, yeah, I take decipher the tech for our general managers and directors and also our owners who don't have, you know, the, uh, the desire to get into the nitty gritty in IT. Um, so I help them along with that. Super. Thank you, Declan. Um, and all the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers are in the chat. I do encourage all of you today to connect and follow up the conversation today as we've got a lot to get through. So a quick overview of how today's webinar is going to run. Um, we're going to spend around 45 minutes chatting with our um, panelists today, followed by some time at the end to take any questions from the floor. So audience members, if you do have a pressing question that you would like to ask any of our speakers today, please submit these uh, using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, and I will get round to asking those as and when relevant. And a reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and everybody that has registered will receive a copy of that recording by Wednesday. So I always like to provide some context um, before we dive into the main, main discussion of today. Um, and for those of you that, that signed up today's webinar, you would have realized that um, I have provided a very brief overview um, of all the different point of sales um, functionalities or features that, are, that exist within the hotel. And also how far point of sales have come, particularly when it comes to new apps and small luxury hotels of the world um, on the 24th of October will launch its first app which will provide guests with an online booking tool to ease that reservation process and other point of sale features such as access to flash sales. They can, I guess, can access their loyalty card information to earn and redeem points and more. Uh, research from Agilisys uh, also revealed that 73% of travelers across APAC would pay 30% more for room upgrades when that is offered post booking and 66% uh, would spend more if the wait time were reduced across all hotel experiences. And we've also seen the impact of music and sporting events on hotel ADRs worldwide. So making sure that hotel websites are optimized with all those seamless booking functionalities is also key here. On the next slide, um, I've taken some headlines from other media sources. Um, and some of these headlines, uh, particularly the one on the top left here, shows some of the current challenges of payment solutions, uh, specifically the inability uh, to integrate payments with other aspects of the customer journey. And this bottom, um, oh sorry, staying with the top headline here, um, this story highlights a survey from uh, two restaurant POS providers, which revealed that the primary concern amongst hospitality executives is fraudulent payments, um, which was cited by 68% of respondents. And the operational downtime caused by these breaches and the costs that are associated with those um, is by far the most concerning issue that could arise from that. Um, and a recent example that we saw earlier this year um, is the cyber attack on Omni Hotels and Resorts. Uh, which triggered outages across the group's reservations and point of sales systems. Um, Omni were very quick to react to that. Um, they took all their systems offline as soon as that cyber attack was um, identified. And I understand it took about one week to restore its IT systems. Um, there were some stories that staff were having to take uh, guest payment details manually. 
you can imagine uh, what a headache that must have caused. So I hope that's given you some food for thought um, as to what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I would like to kick off our conversation with a question to Matthew. Um, and this, this is a question to really kind of highlight exactly um, how far has the POS system evolved over the past decade or so? Over to you, Matthew. Oh, you're on mute. I never do that. I never do that. <laughs> um, well, I had a question for everyone, and probably the listeners uh, are probably got it a bit easier. But does anyone know when the point of sale system was first invented? Anyone? <laughs> 250 years ago, I won't give you too much time to think about it because a quick Google search will give you the answer. But a chap called James Ritty, based in Ohio, was yeah. the individual that was given the uh, accolade for creating the point of sale. And the reason he did that, and it resonates well, Eloise, with what you just said, yeah. because he was experiencing theft from his staff. He needed, he needed a control method ultimately that that allowed him to capture that money and, and not seeing it go out the door but anyway bit of bit of trivia but i thought it resonated well with your your final comments so yeah 250 years of, of point of sale um look uh, from my perspective i don't think the the desires or trends as, as you call them set out i guess by leaders in our industry have, have changed over the last decade except for any legislative matters of course I think the industry has probably been patient in waiting for technology innovators to catch up with those aspirational ideas that we have uh, that perhaps back uh, 10 years ago would have been more blue sky thinking. As I said, you know, 250 years ago, it was about control and there was no real thought for the guests per se. But today it is different. You know, today's control remains a key and much needed attribute. But we now go well beyond those ping and ring terminals of yesterday to, to cater for the multiple demands this modern world throws upon a point of sale system. And I've come up with four trends, all right, four, four ideas to throw for discussion. And, and th those four are engagement and experience levels for both the guest and the operator. And I believe they take centre stage. Um, data collection, sharing analysis and actionable insights being a second ease of transactional processing being a third and labor uh, perhaps much more of a sensitive one in, in our industry today being a four so not not in any particular order uh, but, but they're they're the four that, that i'm going to talk to you about so if we if we just go back to those that engagement experience uh, and again it kind of like dovetails into our our high return hospitality but if we think about the guest you know we have to maximize that emotional moment, maximize that revenue potential, that personal touch, the theater that comes with that experience of being in your um, environment, in the hotel environment. And if we do that, um, that guest is going to spend more whilst they're with you. All right? If we can capitalize on that in real time, rather than the effort required to ensure they return, we benefit twice. We benefit from the fact that hopefully we're going to get them back, but we benefit more from the opportunity of raising the bar whilst they're in the property itself. <clears throat> from an operator perspective, equally important, um, we've got to think about many things, you know, ease of use, speed or accuracy of transaction, modern in its architecture, intuitive in its design and UI. We've got to reduce the cost. We've got to increase the revenue. We've got to eliminate the fraud. We've got to have presentation of meaningful real-time data for instant decision-making. And that's all key in ensuring the operator has good engagement and a good experience. All right, that, that's that's one. The second one is data collection, all right? Being able to connect seamlessly to a hotel's front desk or any other in-house system for that matter is a must, all right? Mm. Posting to rooms is necessary. We know that, we've done it for years. But in my opinion, that's yesterday's intention, all right? Data needs to be shared and being able to even surprise and delight the guest in the moment is, is really, really important. And this technology exists now, whereas in the past it didn't. So now we have to embrace it. All right. And, and that's that's very, very key. Um, and if I continue the theme on data, you know, the ability to profile share 
pushes way beyond the, the, the expected, but I guess critically important matters such as dietary or hygiene needs today. Uh, and it creates a unique transactional footprint for each guest that can be leveraged for the benefit of the operator and for the business and, of course, the guests themselves. Um, if I talk about ease of transactional processing, because, again, this is quite key, <clears throat> can we achieve a tailored one-click transaction? We think about someone approaching the table, pressing multiple buttons. We think about our retail experience. where actually can just be one click and we've done the transaction. All right. Well, now in today's world of F&B, we can absolutely do that. We can make it as trouble free as possible. And I said this in a in a panel I, I presented on a couple of weeks ago. You know, we, we need to stop being behind other industries and we need to get in front. All right. Guests are able to use point of sale in multiple formats through multiple channels, but without commonly shared data. All right. And this is specific to hotels because restaurant chains are different. Their experience is a static and a disparate one. All right. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to, to draw parallels with, with our retail experience. Our retail experience uh, perhaps would be drawn towards Amazon. You know, Amazon and other significant players in that space have one platform, all right? One platform only, all right? And that's how they leverage this ability to understand the data, all right? In a hotel, traditional ways of working is that we don't have one platform. We have mm. disparate platforms and different silos of data, which means we're always going to be working at the same pace we have done year after year after year. Um, retail companies know what you want before you do, right? And then we go and buy it because we're very good at that, I have to say. Yeah. But then we <laughs> buy it, all right? And that's the type of inspiration we need to bring into our industry. You know, we should not be behind other industries. We have some of the most um, innovative and forward thinking individuals in our business. And we should be the leaders in technology provision, not the followers. You know, for me, it's it's one ecosystem, one channel. Hotels, yeah, they're, it's harder than retail. It is. Um, but there's definitely a bright, bright future. Last but not least, and, and perhaps it is most important, is labour. We have to look after our staff. Everyone on this call knows that and knows what the challenges have been over the last few years. Um, this is a tough industry to work in. And, you know, burnout absolutely occurs. I was reading a report generated last week and it said that 50% of managers that were surveyed in the UK cited burnout amongst their peers and even higher at 62% amongst their staff. And again, you know, Technology can be an enabler, can be um, a helpful addition to ensuring that we can reduce those statistics. Um, and tech has a part to play in it. It needs to be easy, intuitive and pain free for the staff. So, look, just, just some of my thoughts around some mm. of the trends and some of the detail around some of those trends as well and what we should really be focusing on. Let's... Um build on that um, and I'd like to come to, to Declan next if I may um, this certainly ties in with um, the last trend there around labour um, Declan how does Hilton's point of sales um, adapt to those different service models in Hilton you've got all the way from your full limited service you have resorts economy all with very different staffing levels right um, so how does that POS adapt across across Hilton's portfolio? Well, this works quite well with uh, basically with our partner um, in uh, point of sale agilisys because um, it's very scalable. So effectively, we have um, some uh, lighter touch hotels, small hotels that, you know, don't have a big F&B uh, outlay, um, nor do the guests in those hotels expect that to be there. And we're able to, some of our uh, properties have got one or two point of sale devices um, and we can literally stand that up. Uh, we have the same integration piece into our uh, property management system. Uh, it's basically all the same. It's just one size fits all. If we have a, a bigger a property, we can put in with some properties that have 30, 40 uh, point of sale um, systems uh, in their 
uh, respective hotels, outlets, rest, uh, restaurants, etc. And we can we we have worked with a lot of different um devices effectively with uh, point of sale. Some of our um hotels have only got a, a tablet service, which basically makes the whole whole system work on a Wi-Fi. So it's very very adaptable, and that's what we have found working uh, with the Genesis over the past couple of years is that um they have basically a system that fits you know small middle large um some that you know need a mobile unit you know some that will work with the fixed terminal you know um system so it's all uh, really really well catered for um we also um have approved their latest system their new system um which basically puts more control in uh, our hands because um, the equipment is agnostic. So we can actually procure the equipment um, ourselves. Um, we can manage it, uh, support it, you know, look after it. We can go very high end and put in iPads. Uh, if we have the, bu the budget, we have the desire, the, the restaurant that we have in the hotel has that feel to it. We can put in high end stuff or we can put in, you know, some of the basic uh, Android uh, devices now um that uh, you know fit that um part of our market we've also uh, was only chatting last week with some of uh, matthew's um colleagues um in, in london at the um the uh, big uh, hotel event that was there and uh, they have now actually uh, showed us a device where the uh, is a payment terminal as well so we will have one device effectively that's able to process an order, you know, um, process the, the table where the customer is, uh, issue a customer a bill after they've had it, and the same device will actually take their payment. And, and that is integrated as well into our um, um, EMS system. So, yeah, it's very adaptable. They, they do have a lot of, um, you know, different um, uh, devices, uh, solutions that we can go to full uh, service, limited service uh, and resort. So um, if you have a, a hotel maybe in the UK and Ireland, you would use a fixed terminal because you're indoors quite a bit. But then we have other properties in Europe that are out in the, uh, you know, the, the like the old martini ad, the waiter who walks down the beach, you know, with his uh, tray. Uh, we can cater for that as well. Super. Thank you, Declan. And, and I like to bring um, Andrew in here um, because you, in your intro, Andrew, you highlighted all the different types of, of hotels and properties within the splendid portfolio. Um, are there any key point of sales features or functionalities that have been um, impactful within your full service hotels? Let's start at the higher end first. Um, yeah, look, I think the, um, the the IT world or the tech world obviously is continuously evolving. And I think mm -hmm. uh, Matthew's opening there was, was really interesting because um, we, we believe exactly the same as what, what he was saying. Um, it's continually evolving. And, and the fact that we feel like sometimes we're behind the curve um, compared to some industries in, in hotels, and it, it shouldn't be like that. I think hospitality has got every dynamic to be um, class leading in, in most of this stuff, not, not uh, waiting to react. Um, in in the full service world, look, I, the higher up the luxury scale you go, our our POS system helps us build a picture or a profile of that guest, and and ultimately um, that is our shop window for somebody walking into one of our hotels or into one of our restaurants, um, and like I say, whether that's a fine dining restaurant or a bite suite, etc., or someone checking into one of our big properties, um, the the advantage of getting ahead and building a picture on somebody before they walk through your door is is absolutely critical to um and again what Matthew was saying we don't look at it as meeting their expectations or or exceeding their expectations actually we want to give them what iClass has unidentified needs and that is to give them something they don't even know they want in the first place and and Matthew's right the tech companies are very good at doing this um and I think what people sometimes forget is is um where a POS system can give you that identification of somebody it can give you their unidentified need and um, the big part of it it's a huge upselling tool and where, what people sometimes forget is upselling is a huge part of service um mm -hmm. to be able to recommend to be able to upsell to be able to give people something they don't want that is part of the journey um, that someone would expect walking into a larger high-end, large F&B property. Um, and I think there's a stigma with that sometimes where people think I'm just trying to flog something to them. I'm just trying to get that extra drink off them, et cetera. It's not, it's part of critical service and it's part of, 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 of delivering it. Um, 
And in some of our, our bigger properties, yeah, look, the, the POS systems that have changed. Um, they, you know, the labor the labor comments very interesting because um, it's not so much that we look for efficiencies in our labor, but we definitely look for effectiveness in our labor. And we've just put um, POS changes recently into one of our big hotels down in London. And um, a, a small element I'll just touch on is they've had, got the ability through their new system actually that you know room service desk is no longer a desk where somebody sits and waits for room service to come in. Room service is now one of the F and B team um, who have the tablet that when a room service comes through, it's highlighted as a room service. It goes off the same back of house system, so all the data is aligned back of house, so you don't have to have two separate systems working. It's highlighted really click, quickly to the kitchen. And it also prompts the room service attendant to make sure that they get their trolley ready, they get the cloches ready. They, you know, all of this stuff all comes together really nicely from a POS system. That actually still means we have the same volume of labor, but they're a lot more effective at what they do. And the byproduct of that, again, is not so much trying to save money on payroll. It means that those, those people on our front line have more time to spend with our customers. And by giving them more time to spend with our customers, actually, we're enhancing the service even, even further than that. So you put a combination of those together and, um, and yeah, it can be really powerful if it's delivered in the right way. I think that you could have a whole conversation, a separate conversation, an hour long conversation just on the prompting side, because that covers upselling, that covers cross selling, that covers checking for allergies and other dietary information that, could, that perhaps can be embedded in all of these systems, um, maybe one for a, for a, a later date. Um, Andrew, does that change in any way? Um, the, the the POS systems that you you have in place with limited service hotels. What's different here? Um, look, I think the the philosophy of it is probably the same. And 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 De Declan talked about how you can have one system that can work across all different levels. And I, I am a I am a big believer of that. I think the select service hotels where they're different. You know, a, a number of our properties um, that are probably under fifty bedroom in a select service eco eco banding. It's very often that there's one person in that hotel running running the property. Um, and, you know, that one person is the duty manager, you know, they are um, the receptionist, they're the person serving a drink on the bar, you know, they, they are the all in cumbersome uh, general service assistant in, in these smaller select service mm -hmm. properties. The, the ability to have self-order to self-pay in those properties via a POS system is critical. Um, and, you know, if I put my, my operator hat on, um, ultimately what I think people in those properties want is efficiency they want it to work quick they want it to be very simple to work and they want it to operate as smoothly as possible you know they, they just don't need the clunkiness that some old pos systems can have and i think again rather than somebody being on the desk who's then having to take the order having to process the order having to take payment if that can be done autonomously or by the by the guest again it allows that person free time to be with the guest and actually enhance their stay and i think the ability to to, to have that self-order to self-pay is really really key one of one of the real key elements to it is it has to be user friendly. It has to be user friendly. You know, I won't mention any names, but I've eaten recently at a couple of quick service restaurants, and one of them was absolutely fantastic, and one of them was painful. And I know which one I'd go back to again. And it was all due down to the POS. It has a massive impact on the guest journey. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, Andrew. Christian, um, let's talk about selecting right partners and looking. Uh, we're going to move on a bit later. Um, to talk about integration here, because I know that that is a, can be a real headache for some hoteliers. But um, when you're selecting uh, a tech partner like a point of sale system, uh, what are some of the key factors that hoteliers should be considering? So when, when we look at partners, we're, we're looking at a few things. Um, obviously, budget will play a role in, in kind of the hardware that you're working with um, in property at the time. Um, well, that that will obviously depend on your upfront cost and and the ongoing running cost of the system um will need to be taken into consideration um but as you know Matthew and uh, Andrew have pointed out obviously the effectiveness of your staff is 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 very important um you know and that that really is one of the two main things i think to consider is is the functionality of the system to make sure that it's it's fit for purpose, you know some yeah, depending on the asset, you know some assets where you have let's say we've got hotels where big function they all break at the same time, um, and you have three hundred people coming into a bar and, and need to be served. Um, we previously had a a POS where we just 
the, the process took too long. Um, you know, in even one second, I think we worked it out how many kind of orders we lost. Um, so it, it's really that functionality and making sure that it is effective for for the the property and and is able to to cope with with the requirements. Obviously, we have. Uh, if you have big M and E facilities, that that needs to be taken into consideration because that also has some more kind of functionality that's required to again enhance that the, the experience for the the booker or the the, the person um, attending that function. And then, yeah, as you say, Louisa, the the integration is is so key, and and I think historically that that was always a a challenge where you have to integrate with a number of systems ideally um so that, that that they can you know make the operation more efficient to make sure that it speaks with your pms your accounting system any booking channels you have and importantly that that credit card system just because the amount of errors that can be made without that integration is is uh is painful um and for us i mean as as kind of owners and operators we're, we're always data hungry uh, there's so much data being generated by the, these hotels and, and not always used um, to their optimum. So it's really kind of finding the, you know, using those reporting tools so that you can make decisions um, on kind of menu selections, um, but also kind of looking at effectiveness and, and creating that guest experience and finding out where kind of the the points are where where you're losing time. Um, mm. But having said all that, you know it can all be made very easily easy for you because sometimes the brands just say this is a system you need to use. So that uh, <laughs> kind of all the considerations there are are then um, you know driven by the brand. But you know they they will have also thought of these and kind of what's being discussed here is you know the a lot of it is aligned where you know the brand and operators and owners kind of are are looking at the same things but just from through a different lens mm-hmm. do, do you mind if i just uh step in Eloise? just a couple of, of things that christian <laughs> mentioned uh one was more just as a uh just some relevance really behind your you know speeding up the transaction uh i, I had some good fortune spending many years in the stadium industry and, you know, two or three seconds at half time in a 60, 70, 80, 90,000 seater stadium, if you could just finesse that speed of transaction, it equated to thousands and thousands of pounds worth of additional opportunity uh, in, in those, those finite half time intervals. If, if you took a, a football game, for example, and, and secondly, when, when you talk about data, and I, I think Andrew touched on it there's always exceptions there are always significant leaders in the hotel space but as as a, as a general theme i you know gathered information last week and, and over the last few months that that suggested that we have some amazing marketeers across the country in our hotel groups some amazing um marketeers that, that gather this data from all the siloed systems crunch that data and produce some incredible rois uh for uh you know, future guest stays. But what seemed to be lacking the time was what was happening in the moment. I, and I did reference that earlier, but but again, it, it's it's having the benefit of both worlds. It's, it's dealing with the in the moment matters collectively as an industry, not just having, uh, you know, certain individual hotels that are, that are leaders, but, mm-hmm. but meaning that everyone can share in this enjoyment of having the data during people's, stay as well as post people stay as well so again Mm -hmm. just just some some food for thought really matthew let's stay with you um for the next question because we've talked up until now about about a need to innovate about about the need to be perhaps sector industry leading sector leading um rather than lagging behind other other industries such as retail retail Uh, but matthew how can hotels ensure that their point of sale is not only scalable, but can actually accommodate that future growth, accommodate all these new um, upcoming trends, um, not just from the tech element, but also uh, staffing trends, booking trends, you know, guest behavior trends, all of it combined over to you. Well, I think 
first and foremost, it dovetails into again something that Christian said. You know, you've got to do your due diligence in the uh, procurement of a platform that's going to benefit you, benefit you and your business, not just today, but for the next decade, for the next two decades. It's 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 to ask the right questions, and if if you as a as a small hotel group perhaps doesn't have that capacity, then then you know you need to reach out to others. In, in the industry that can help and support you along that way. But, you know, obvious questions are, you know, how old is the software I'm buying? You know, how intuitive is it? What architecture is it? You tend not to find those particular questions being asked of uh, smaller hotels or smaller hotel groups, but it's still vitally important. You want to go on a journey with that supplier that you invest in and you want to make sure that in five, 10 years time, you know, I'm still seeing innovation. And I'm not seeing that innovation dry up. And and again, I I touched on that before. <clears throat> I think hoteliers definitely have choices to be made. We can either plod along at a pace familiar with the last decade and keep falling behind these tech savvy generation Z and now those alpha individuals that are coming along and, and just really do what we were doing before and procure in the same way. Or we can just have a mindset shift. All right. And our mindset shift should be heading towards how we can continue to maximize the interaction with that guest, how we can personalize that guest, and not just do the things that we were doing for the last 10 to 20 years, because that's what we were doing. And that's why we should carry on. Well, you shouldn't. We need to think about methodical changes and how that will benefit our operation. So <clears throat> if we do want to change, then we have another benefit, another choice. You know, we, we can we can demand that that innovation continues at a pace never seen before in this industry. I hear horror stories of having worked in this industry for, for 25 years where systems don't get updated for months, for years, but we're kind of like happy with that. We just accept that that's the pace we should run at. Whereas if we go on a particular website, again, in the retail world, uh, it may have changed from the last time we saw it. So it's again, really pushing the boundaries and, and, and redrawing the lines of what we deem as an appropriate innovation pace and an appropriate way in which we can deliver technology features, functions, that's always going to continue to meet the needs of the industry that we thrive within. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really boiling down to the due diligence and ensuring that you work with the right partner. What we don't want to see is innovation drying up. All right. Mm -hmm. um, for us, of course, that means it, it's one platform. It's it's the ability to share data, to mine that data in a way that's meaningful, real time, post property. And the overriding benefit is that we keep seeing our customers return. All right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, certainly, certainly a few things I've thrown at everyone there, I guess. <laughs> Due diligence is, is one of them, but ensuring that you invest in a in a modern forward thinking organization. Thanks. Thanks for that, Matthew. And once again, we're going to build on top of that um, because you touched on guest preferences, guest behavior. Um, something that I'm seeing a lot of at the moment is grab and go. A lot of, a lot of be, it, be it lifestyle hotels, be it sort of select service hotels, be it extended stay hotels, grab and go seems to be um, an, a, an emerging option, um, perhaps uh, balanced against the idea that um, Customers are now want that self service, and they're happy um, to 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 cater to themselves, um, if if you like. And and Declan, um, can you talk to us about how uh, Hilton is is also its its systems are supporting these various modes of operation, such as the in room dining, the grab and go, the room surface, uh, but also how you're adapting that and involving the POS um, in order to meet these new needs, um, QR code, mobile ordering, contactless payments and such. Yeah, we we have, um, how to put it, uh, I suppose, expanded a lot of different uh, options that we have with um, Agilis uh, in that, in our, our point of, of sale, because I think the, the world is a very different now post-COVID. People just want to, how to put it, you know, they don't want the uh, the interaction. They just want to get in. They want to get out. It could be primarily in the morning time where, you know, they, 
they're either uh, not a morning person or they get out of bed quite late and uh, you know just want to be able to get some access to breakfast and they will want to um, just grab it and they want to go so these have been a couple of projects we've worked on with the Genesis over the past um um what do you call it, a couple of um, years re uh, recently we've started to um integrate in with the chaos system that they have which basically gives us the opportunity to be able to have a lot of product available so the customer can come down and then basically they can uh, scan it themselves and then you know it, we integrate into our um uh, partner for payments and then they're literally they're gone so it gives them the op option and it's a big thing in our industry to give customers options effectively so they can either check in online they don't want to see anybody they don't want to greet anybody they go straight to their room uh, with the digital key the same thing with the mm -hmm. fmb systems is that they can you know grab something and uh, you know just go we've done a lot of work as well in the mobile ordering um piece of things so we've um developed really quickly over the past couple of years with um a mobile order Drink. So you can have to put an order, uh, an entire meal through the mobile ordering system. And, you know, uh, it's kind of, you know, why didn't we wake up to this a long time ago? Because, you know, uh, Uber Eats and other people have been ahead of that, you know, game. So, you know, were we missing an opportunity? But now we have that opportunity to give, you know, the customer the same type of platform you know, that they can uh, eat um, from, from a menu. And the beauty about the system as well is that with uh, the changes in law in relation to allergens and stuff, you know, the changes in law with, you know, calories and stuff like that, we can actually give that now to the customer so they can make an educated decision, you know, basically uh, on an app, you know, that, yes, I'm not allergic to this, this is good. Um, and also those people who are calorie counting, you know, can do all of this as well, uh, all on a lovely device that they're carrying around with them all the time. You know, so it, it's really, really good. They can do the whole transaction. They can literally book. They know how many calories. They know if they're allergic. They can check it out. They can pay for it and they're gone. You know, and kids these days, to, you know, to be honest with you, are the younger people just love that. You know, it's everything. You need an API for almost everything now, you know, for them to be able to, uh, you know, be interested effectively because uh, that's what they were doing during COVID with other operators. We actually did that in one of our hotels in Dublin, whereby, you know, we offered afternoon tea uh, on a QR code and we were able to get that delivered to customers, you know, who were at home and have the entire experience at home. So it's a big uh, thing, you know, for us. And, you know, uh, we had a lot of pushback, I suppose, in mobile or ordering you know because people were sort of saying yes we're going to replace me you now i've got the you know the the this is all going into the cloud and they can do all of that and then you know my philosophy in that was well you as a waiter need to beat the cloud so effectively we have uh, strangely enough a a, a a bar in our um uh, hotel in Deansgate, which is called Cloud Twenty Three, and we put it in there, and effectively it worked. It it blended and complemented the waiter staff. So, rather than a person waiting for their champagne to arrive, they could go in the QR code, they could pay for it. It was just delivered. You know what uh, I often said to staff in there is as well. Your objective should be to beat the AI, beat the robot. If you want the tip, yeah, the computer. <laughs> computer you know it won't know what to do with a tip yeah so uh, you know it's going to compliment you for those busy seasons uh, b busy times so we actually don't lose the guest so they have an operation to have the, the physical side with the operator there and also you know they can do it uh, totally online i'm i'm a believer that if um it, it is worrying that staff genuinely can be concerned or fearful that certain tech or maybe AI might replace their jobs. Um, as somebody who has worked in hotels um, as a host for um, afternoon tea, for example, that genuinely does concern me. But I am a firm believer that um, it's perhaps there's more um, education and training needed amongst at, at a property Absolutely. level it, to it, it showcase. Just, it just, yeah, it just complements it, you know, because there's there's always people that are going to say, you know, Matthew always gives me my nice table by the window or whatever. There's there's no AI, there's no QR system that's going to give you that. Do you know what I mean? So there are still people out there for that. But now, you know, we can maybe go for 
you know, a particular generation of people that, you know, would like to talk directly with Matthew. And then there's other ones that just want to, you know, go through uh, the machine. So it's about basically capturing all of the market mm. so that you have it all. And it's there to complement, you know, I mean, there's other people like you know, even young people who are, you know, uh, allergic to tech. And they just want to see a person, you know, make my order, bring it to my table, you know. Um, so it's all about giving people options. Mm-hmm. I think um, I think the Optimus robot that we've seen in recent days has still got a long way to go before we start seeing <laughs> an individual like that in our hotels. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've, we've touched on this earlier about the uh, data, collecting data, capturing data, measuring, tracking, reporting <clears throat> on it. Um, and I want to come back to Andrew um, and then over to, to Christian for, for my next couple of questions. Um, Andrew, how are you using some data analytics from your point of sales um, in order to identify these trends that we've been talking about just a moment ago um, to capture those opportunities, make sure that nothing is effectively left on the table and also looking at improvements um, coming down the line? Do you know, it's, it's a real interesting point because um, I think Matthew mentioned it before around we in the industry, we can stay as what we did in the last 10 years or we can actually grab it by the horns and run forward with it. And I think if you look at data from, um, if I use an F&B space, for example, we've always done stock takes in our in our hotels and our bars and our food and beverage outlets. Um, and we can continue to do stock takes for the next 10, 15 years. And you know what, the world will keep turning and life will still go on, it's fine. But there's a huge difference, in my opinion, from um, I know that I sold two tenths of that gin last month to a difference of I know I sold two tenths of that gin last month and I know what time I sold it to and I know who I sold it to and I know when the best point is for me to upsell that gin to a certain type of person. Um, That's not just data, that's insightful data. And, and I think there's a huge difference between both of those. We can, can do the first way, no, no problem. But actually, mm-hmm. if we want to modernize the business and get with it, we need to do it the, the, the latter way. And, and I think that has two massive opportunities for both front of house and back of house. Um, you know, and from a front of house perspective, if you stick with the gin analogy, you know, if I know that this bar X is selling the premium gin between six and eight o'clock, has the system got the ability to do surge pricing? So, you know, again, using the stadium analogy, you know, 5p on a lot is a lot, you know, so actually am I maximizing those trading periods where people want to drink that specific type of product? Um, is the POS system then prompting the bar staff that actually now's the time to get the POS displays out or now's the time to push that product, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, all of this stuff, it just makes a life easier for the person who's physically serving the drink. And, and one way is really effective, really efficient. And again, it gives great service to the guest. And the other way is OK, but it's what we've done for the past 15, 20 years. And I think we are at that crossroad where some operators will go one way or the other. Um, so, so, yeah, I th- look, I think data is key. Um, again someone before mentioned that the sharing of data is also key i think in the industry sometimes we get a little bit held up with who owns the data um and as an operator and own well as a company who owns hotels and operates multiple uh, branded hotels we would look just love to have access to all data um because if we had that data suite wow that could be really powerful and you know the link up of that with ai which we talked about before is again you know imagine if i knew that someone come to my hotel who booked via uh, front POS system, like their room warm, for example, because we built up this picture of them and they go to check into their room and that's linked to a really cool AI system that puts the heating on in the room prior to the coming in. So they're walking into a lovely warm room. You know, how, how powerful could that be? Um, but to do that, we've got to have access to data. We have to know and understand the <clears> analytics. <throat> we have to know that person's booking pattern. And, and sometimes with brands and multiple operators, it's very hard to do that. Um, but look, if you, if, if, if you use data in the smart way, in the right way, and you have the right POS system, it could literally transform your business no two ways. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Christian, um, what I think it was, it may have been yourself who mentioned, you know, looking at data analytics of of the POS. Um, same question to you. How 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 are you looking at data analytics uh, to identify trends and opportunities? How often are you looking at that? Um, for example, what what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I guess it's something that um, hotels haven't, or I guess it's evolving in in, in how that data is used. And and you know, as as Andrew says, it's it's all about you making sure we use that data to kind of benefit 
um, the hotel as a whole. Um, you know, making sure that you have the right uh, food and drink available, making sure that um, you know that the system provides you with a lot of information, such as you know which dishes are selling, which are not. How do you kind of maximize the um, kind of through sale of items mm -hmm. on on your menus? Um, and you know, so we I guess at a hotel level, so that that data is being reviewed on you know almost daily basis um and future decisions are made on that and I, I think that's where historically maybe the systems weren't really used to their full potential or couldn't provide this sort of information but there's so much data there in terms of the you know, staffing the areas in the right way because you can see exactly what time um it's busy and then you know looking at cross-training people so that they could go back into other departments. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was kind of from a basic point of kind of transactional speed and reliability, the, the data side of things is very valuable um, for properties. And I think we'll start seeing um, that data being used a lot more. And it'd be great to uh, have that added to Okay, whatever benchmarking system, right? Because it, it's so valuable and it, it's kind of, we can learn so much from it. And and how do you, on moving on to the, the measuring aspect here, Christian, how do you quantify the success of, of a POS system? I think it's hard uh, to, to really quantify it in the sense that you, because you generally, it, it's quite a big investment and you kind of, you don't have the opportunity to compare one against the other, perhaps. So, you know, you're replacing a system and then generally you would hope that that system is performing better than what you previously had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to Matthew's point is that it is a decision that's made um, only once every 10, 15 years because there there is a lot of capital outlay and you know, generally, um, that there isn't not it's not easy for, to change that system regularly. But it's it's kind of the the main thing is from what we touched on previously is kind of how you know easy it is to use within the property, which then feeds into how successful it is from the sales. You know, is it is it easy to put. Mm -hmm that order through is it easy to pay and that then allows you to um kind of sell more and that data is very useful because you can then see how productive the system is for you and you can also make the right decisions in what sort of food and drink you're selling um but also make decisions on where you know perhaps something isn't selling or too mm -hmm. many people were there and someone was not as as productive or or effective as as they could have been. Mm -hmm. I just jump in there as well, just Please. for another another thing um, is that a lot of systems um, that they're, they're not managed properly in businesses. Um, it does take a lot of you know management of a system. So good data in equals good data out. You know, so you need to actually uh, invest in that to get that done. And we have found this in, in some of our systems uh, before we moved to centralized menus with Agilisys because we were able to get good data because it was managed properly. And some of them that hadn't managed properly, they had learned from, you know, the person sitting beside them to actually then manage the system. And it's only when you step back and analyze that and you 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 look and you say how many times can you spell Budweiser and I've never seen Budweiser spelt with an F before, you know. But um, this is the information, so it's critical that you have to invest the time in this to make sure that you've got good data coming in, and then you'll get your good data out. So then that will give you the benefit then effectively, you know, through the system to identify trends, you know, to identify, you know, a lot of stuff in there, but it does take time and it does take, you know, a people investment in the system to help you, you know, understand these things. And I see the measure of success in a system that's able to give you data back to say that um, Matthew actually upsells more than Declan does. 
you know, why is he always set a dessert? Do you know what I mean? But Declan doesn't set a dessert, you know. So there's a lot of stuff in the system you can actually preen out of it and you can make smarter choices then for either upselling, you know, upscaling, you know, of <clears> individuals <throat> to get the actual success of your system. Thank you, Declan. I was going to say, enough said. <laughs> Brilliant. Sorry. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Um, I can see that we have uh, three minutes um, on the clock. So um, I'm going to take this opportunity to say thank you to, to Declan, to Matthew, to Andrew and Christian for their insights. Uh, we're going to leave this webinar open right at the end here, um, just to allow our audience members to follow up on any of the links that we have popped into the chat. Um, but before we um, sign off completely, I just have some closing slides that I would like to run through before we say a formal goodbye. Um, we at Boutique Hotel News are launching a whole sustainability themed webinar series, um, which is going to kickstart next week. Um, the first episode in that series is called, What Does It Mean to Be a Sustainable Hotel? We would absolutely love to see you there and you can sign up to register um, by clicking on the link that has been posted in the chat. And right at the end of October, on October the 30th, we are hosting an in-person event in London at uh, LOSCA, which is taking on a tech theme. We have a presentation um, about what is tech-enabled hospitality. We have a panel discussion about digitally innovating the guest journey. And we also have a debate um, arguing the all-in-one versus marketplace PMS. Again, we would absolutely love to see you there in person and you can buy your tickets by following the link that has been popped into the chat. And if you're interested in working with us either across our in-person events or perhaps our digital events like this one today, please do get in touch with my colleague Piers. His details are on your screen and also in the chat there. So once again, uh, thank you to our panelists today for their contributions. Um, a delight as always to partner with Agilisys on a topic like this. And um, I look forward to seeing you um, either next week for the next Boutique Hotel News webinar, or perhaps in person at the end of the month. So take care folks, thanks for tuning in and look forward to seeing you soon. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.